June 9, 1944. Allied troops in Normandy have moved inland. The work of the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard and the combined Allied Sea Forces has been done. Work not without a price in men and materiel. began many months earlier. In Chesapeake Bay and other sections of the American coast, untested sailors and soldiers learned the task of getting from ship to shore. But that time, the shore was a friendly one. Then, with part of their training finished, they left the United States. Late in the winter and all through the spring, the great convoys moved eastward across the Atlantic. Aboard all the transports, life was the same. The troops relaxed and waited for the voyage to end. that spring, the training went on. Navy and Coast Guard landing barges practiced landing operations day and night. <laughs> Meanwhile, the larger landing craft LSTs and LCIs carried on their maneuvers, learning to land at a given spot at a certain time. days of preparation, Allied planes, thousands of them, continued to soften enemy defenses and communications in daily raids. <laughs> Off the southern coast of England, Thousands of ships from all allied nations are preparing for the invasion signal. Navy and Coast Guard crews make last minute preparations. rations come aboard, everyone knows that D-Day is drawing near. Somewhere in southern England, troops embark on LCVPs to be ferried to the waiting transports offshore.
supplies are loaded. The next time these men step ashore will be on an enemy beach. There's only a little time left to relax. And the bombing attacks of the Air Force are intensified. Now the raids are continuous. of embarkation, the troops prepare themselves for their greatest battle. Briefs his men, and all along the coast, sailors receive their final instructions. At last, the ships leave the coastal waters and move out into the channel. The slow LSTs loaded with heavy equipment, the transports loaded with men. Warships screen the mighty invasion fleet from enemy raiders. At 15.30, a Coast Guard flotilla of LCIs leaves, loaded with engineers, medical corpsmen, and infantry. D-Day approaches, and the ships are in their assigned positions. For some of them, like the Coast Guard manned transport chase, it is the fourth invasion in European waters. The only planes overhead are friendly. foot Coast Guard rescue boats to the Navy's powerful battle wagons, the invasion fleet is moving towards France. And below decks, officers study the maps that mark the invasion beachheads on the coast of Normandy.
the landing barges are stopped by concrete obstacles built far out in the water by the enemy. Offshore, the larger landing craft approach the beachhead slowly. firing range, the LSTs wait to move in until the beaches are cleared. The arrival of motorized equipment marks the end of the first phase of the landing. The LCIs, their first loads of men now on the beaches, go out to the transports to ferry more troops inshore. Still waiting beyond gun range, the LSTs unload supplies on smaller LCTs. Heavier equipment is transferred to giant rhino ferries, flat-bottomed barges that will land it ashore. And reinforcements arrive, thousands of men. and disarmed, the first German soldiers captured in France wait until someone has time to evacuate them. Out in the channel, the rescue boats of the Coast Guard are looking for survivors and aiding damaged vessels. and the hospital ships are waiting for the wounded. From a damaged Coast Guard LCI, a wounded man is transferred to another ship. The life-saving blood plasma goes with him. Another Coast Guard manned LCI, badly crippled, could not reach the shore, and its wounded are removed. is firmly in allied hands now, and the vast extent of the operation is visible. Silent evidence of the fierce battle is apparent everywhere.
But in a few days, many of the damaged ships will be afloat again. Now, more and more troops move inland to push the enemy back. And the LSTs land their cargoes on the beach. Barges built especially for the Normandy operations are left on the shore to be unloaded. During the daytime, there are only allied planes in the air. But at night, German bombers harass the beachhead and drop mines offshore. Out of sunken block ships, artificial harbors have been built. Until a port is won from the enemy, these must handle all allied shipping. Bad weather came after the fighting on the beaches was over. The heavy storm left a trail of damaged ships. Once again, the landing barges moved out into the channel, this time loaded with German prisoners. In England, prisoners board a Coast Guard transport. Ships which have carried thousands of American soldiers overseas now return westward with a different cargo, with men who were beaten and captured in Normandy. <laughs> Number one, June 6th, Allied Headquarters. Under command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces began landing Allied armies on the northern coast of France. The greatest news story in 1944, D-Day, H-Hour. That fateful moment for which the whole world held its breath. But in the night hours of D-Day minus one, long before these first assault boats nosed onto the beach, American fighting men, Troop carriers, paratroops, airborne infantry, and glidermen were already there. This picture is a small tribute to those men, living and dead, who went in before H hour on D-Day, five hours ahead of the main force, to start the destruction of Fortress Europe. Their story begins in a village in England, not the kind of village that you ever saw or read about, but a strange, unsightly place one that had sprung up almost overnight and was known to its citizens as Shantytown. Its buildings were fashioned entirely from heavy boxes and shipping crates used in transporting thousands of gliders from the United States. It was a growing community. Every time a glider moved out of its crate, there were impatient tenants waiting to move in and set up housekeeping. Or perhaps a business establishment. 
And everyone in town was there for one purpose. For the day when they would join forces with the British to make the big jump. The jump that would carry them not only across the English Channel, but across an almost solid wall of steel and iron and guns and ruthless, determined men trained for generations in the art of death and destruction. But impregnable as these defenses appeared, we had a plan to surmount them. The wall of fortifications stretched along the entire coast of Europe. Part of the plan called for our air forces to carry an army of paratroops and airborne infantry over this wall. The chiefs of staff wanted them dropped deep in German-held territory to establish defense areas and block the movement of the enemy reserves. Then they decided the invasion spearhead was to strike in Normandy. Immediately, troops began to be dispatched to special takeoff points all over England where they would stand by until the final word was given. Heroes in the making rode the highways of England that day. Busloads of them. As to how they felt riding into their first real battle, well, we'll let one of them tell you. It was just another ride at first, taking us somewhere for another training hop, maybe. After 18 months of training, you get so you don't expect anything else. At least that's the way we paratroops figured, and I, I guess the glider guys felt pretty much the same. But we found out different. They took us to a sealed airport where nobody was allowed in and none of us allowed out. This didn't bother the hot lake swingsters. We kept in shape with regular exercises and then maybe a game or two. We knew there was something cooking now, something big. And we spent any spare time we could find in reading letters from home or, or maybe writing one to the folks and that special girl. Invasion markings painted on every ship and glider brought the whole thing even closer to us. We'd soon be on our way. Money was passed out. The kind you can spend in France. They hadn't forgotten a thing we'd need. Neither had we. But when these were taken care of, not many of us forgot that for our kind of guys, knives and guns aren't enough. we were really ready. General Ike nearly tore his pants stepping over the barbed wire, but he didn't care. He wanted to talk to us. Ike had a lot of questions to ask. What's your name, soldier, he says. Where's your hometown? Who's the toughest man in the outfit? We told him we'd give him the answer to that last one when we got back. He inspected a few of the boys who really have to be tough, the Pathfinder. They go in ahead of all of us and plant signal markers so we can find a way. They live on a steady diet of danger. When I got through with us, we were all keyed up, raring to go. And then it was time. Most of these men had never seen real combat, but remember them. Look at their faces. They've seen plenty of action since. They're the boys of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. The men who faced von Rundstedt in Belgium stopped them cold at Bastogne and Stavolo. given us brand new parachutes, and I remember one little guy saying he wasn't worried none about him opening because the company that made him was in his hometown and his mother worked there in final inspection. A few of the outfits got the idea they ought to show the Germans we had Indians in America. Here they are. Indians from the Loop, from Back Bay, and the Bronx. Climbing into the ship, some of us were loaded so heavy that we had to be shoved on board by the others or we'd have never made it.
boating went on into the night. And we were in our places and ready long before takeoff time. Then we heard the roar of engines as the Pathfinder ships began hopping off. following soon after. That takeoff was something I'll never forget. Sure, we'd all made a lot of training hops, but this was different. Like the first time you ride a bicycle, only with a whole lot farther to fall if anything goes wrong. Nothing did, though. Not with those troop carrier guys at the controls. Talk about making trains run on time. You could have really set your watch by the split second way those guys took us off. They took those ships off the ground like it was just another practice run. For them, I guess it was. After all, they were going to have to fly it again and again, all night and the next day, only under fire. And that's no fun when you figure that these C-47s haven't any armor, no guns, and have to fly low over the dropping zones, straight as on a bombing run. After we hit the channel and started across, Every light went out. We had no idea where we were when we got the order to stand up and hook up. That came so quick we didn't have time to do much thinking before we were over the side and starting that 400-foot drop into France. Thousands of us. bunch of gliders. It seemed forever before they hit the ground. They were like clay pigeons for the German snipers. The glider pilots really had their hands full bringing those babies down in the dark that way. There were darn few signal lights to help them find their way. The Germans had caught a good many of our pathfinders and kept them pinned to the ground with crossfire almost from the minute they'd set down. They had to do their work lying flat on the ground. But those gliders got down. And the troops and guns inside them got into the fight. The pilots fighting right along with them. I guess we did plenty of damage that night. Yes, they did plenty of damage. Blocking road junctions, knocking out bridges, capturing fields for airstrips. And all the while, out in the channel behind them, Navy guns kept slamming away at the beaches softening things up for the big push that would begin at dawn. Clearing the way for the biggest invasion in history. The greatest movement of men and supplies. The troop carrier command was ready for its next move. They had massed hundreds of British and American gliders in preparation for the most gigantic aerial towing job ever attempted. Each held a full cargo of jeeps and guns and the fighting men to use them. The lives and success of those who were already in France depended on the flight of this vast armada. They were greatly outnumbered and desperately needed these reinforcements. How they got them, a story of two-way air traffic and an unbroken chain of planes and gliders stretching from England to France and back again is best told by a man who was a part of it all. Maybe we glider pilots didn't show it, but we were as excited over flying across that English Channel as Blairy must have been when he flew it for the first time, years before most of us were born. He didn't have much of an airplane under him, but then there weren't any German guns waiting for him on the other side. We did a bit of wondering about those guns as we started out over the channel and the lighthouses of England began slipping away beneath us. And what about the German Luftwaffe? This was its big chance. 
Our air forces had established air supremacy, sure. We had a regular umbrella of fighters over us. But if there was ever a time the German flyers would try anything to break through, this was that time. But we never saw a German plane. Approaching the French coast, the ak, -Ak and gunfire seemed harmless and far away. For those who were right in it, it was different. It gave us a feeling of pride to be a part of it all, looking down at those men on the beaches of Normandy. We felt a little guilty, too, sitting up over them, not even getting our feet wet. Germans flooded entire areas to slow us up if a beachhead was established. We kept watching for those who had gone in during the night, but we only saw their parachutes. There was no sign of them. The first glider, we'd find out pretty soon what had happened. Got loose. Roger. So long. We stretched our glides as much as possible. That way, we ended up near the edge of the fields where we could run for cover as soon as we got out. Not everybody came down exactly where they wanted to. One glider went right into a German field headquarters. And what was that I said about not getting our feet wet? This bunch was lucky. The Germans were under control in this section. But more than one tow ship and glider made its last flight that day. Guns didn't do all the damage. 15-foot poles driven into the ground ripped off wings and smashed through fuselages. The men who stepped out of this glider will never know if their first mission was successful. But it was plenty. Yes, their mission had been successful. But this down payment on freedom ran very high. These broken wings served the highest purpose. They carried an army into Normandy. An army which spearheaded the Allied invasion, carried the fight for freedom right to the front door of those who had challenged it. A ring of steel and iron and guns and determined free men was closing in. Months and miles of battle lay ahead, but D-Day minus one was the beginning. Okay, troop carrier, where do we go from here? At Quebec, Canada in 1943, Roosevelt and Churchill, acting on the advice of their military staffs, made the momentous decision to invade Europe. Three months later at Turan, Roosevelt, Stalin and Churchill met, and the invasion date was set so that it would coincide with the Russian offensives. Thus, the utmost pressure would be brought to bear on Germany simultaneously on every front by Russian, American, and British forces. But the Germans had not been idle. They had constructed with slave labor a complex and massive series of fortifications along the coasts of Europe. Heavy gun emplacements, minefields, tank traps, and pillboxes formed a barrier beyond which it seemed no enemy could pass. In 
into the planning and building of these great fortifications went the best ability of the German general staff, whose members repeatedly inspected the Atlantic Wall for possible weaknesses. And the German general staff pronounced it impregnable. But in the spring of 1944, an allied weapon the Germans had underestimated began to make its power felt with ever-increasing frequency. Allied bombers intensified the systematic destruction of German production facilities. Royal Air Force and U.S. Army planes flew side by side in the great bombing raids. And it's 1 o'clock, Dick. I see them, I see them. Gradually, the Allies won control of the air over Europe. By May of 1944, the stockpiles of U.S. and British supplies in England had reached a point which guaranteed that the Allied armies would lack for no piece of essential equipment. England had become one vast warehouse for the coming invasion. Then, early in June of 1944, at headquarters in England, the High Command met. In command of all Allied ground forces was General Sir Bernard Montgomery. The time had come to start the most brilliantly conceived campaign in history. First, thousands of British and American fighters and bombers began a sustained attack on German installations along the invasion coast. German trains, airfields, and planes were strafed in lightning low-level attacks. Junctions were dissolved into dust and flame. Then came June 6, 1944, a day which marks a step forward in the progress of mankind. British and American warships tossed thousands of tons of high explosives on enemy beach defenses and strong points. Then, in the early dawn, the power amassed by years of allied energy and sacrifice met the best the Germans were able to offer. Onto the beaches of France poured the fighting men of Great Britain and America, and on the beaches many died. After 24 hours of desperate fighting, the first phase was over. The landings had been made and were being held. Nineteen days later, the Cotentin Peninsula had been all but overrun in a series of bitterly contested battles. Supplies and reinforcements, in a volume and at a speed which the Germans had not believed possible, were moving up across the beaches and through the improvised ports the Allies had created. And when the battle for the port of Cherbourg was joined, there was no lack of material to hamper the Allied assault troops. By June 27th, the last of the German garrison troops had surrendered, and the Allies were assured of what they most needed, a deep water port. But first, the German demolitions had to be cleared up, and acres of docks rebuilt. 
Within a few weeks, American engineers had performed miracles of improvisation, and the port's capacity to handle freight was raised to more than its pre-war level. Then, when an enormous supply of men and equipment had been built up on the peninsula, the breakthrough began. Generals Eisenhower and Bradley had been planning an all-out assault. General Patton, specialist in mechanized warfare, had his armored divisions ready. On July 25th, a 2,000-plane bombardment of the San Lo area was ordered. Within hours, Patton's tanks and men began to fall through the gap. Then started a demonstration of mobility and power by men who had always understood the use of machines, whether for war or peace. The weight of this offensive carried the American troops across the Breton Peninsula in four days. While the British and Canadians held the Germans' heaviest armor at Caen, the Americans swung north to form a trap full of Germans at Falaise. The Germans, hammered by a ring of massed artillery fire and by aerial bombardment, found themselves undergoing the confusion and terror which they had brought to so many of Europe's defeated nations. South of Ka, the British and Canadian armies withstood the frantic efforts of the Germans to break out of the trap. By the 14th of August, the pocket had been reduced. German offensive strength in Western France was broken beyond any chance of recovery. Meanwhile, the lack of ports and railroads had been partially overcome by the Allies. An express line of heavy-duty trucks was organized. 24 hours a day at 40 miles per hour, the trucks were bringing up supplies from the beachheads to the front line. Then, on August 15th, the Allies struck from a new direction. The liberation of southern France began. Here, as in Normandy, paratroopers and airborne infantry led the attack. 9,000 of these shock troops landed well behind the German-fortified coastal zone. And with them, landed their weapons, rations, and ammunition. While the airborne army was at work cutting German lines of communication, the amphibious forces staged a perfectly executed landing along the Riviera. In spite of German resistance, American, British, and French fighting forces screamed ashore and began their drive toward the ports of Toulon and Marseille and up the valley of the Rhone toward the German border. Then came the news from inside Paris. For four desperate days, starting on August 19th, the French forces of the interior had been battling the Germans inside the city. After four years of German rule, Paris began recreating, with the courage of her own people, the glory of France. After merciless fighting, during which individual heroism was often pitted against German tanks, the FFI issued a call for help. Paris was all but surrounded by American forces. To restore France's faith in her own arms, 
the assignment to free Paris was given to the French 2nd Armored Division. Quickly, the French division, with its American equipment, moved up to Paris. In command was General Jacques Leclerc, veteran of the African campaign, a soldier of consummate skill. And in Paris, the French division, which was to bear the brunt of the fighting against Germans in the city, was welcomed with all the affection a grateful Paris could express. Now that the French, reinforced by professional soldiers, had tank to pit against tank, the outcome could not be in doubt. The Germans soon lost their love of battle in the face of certain defeat. By August 25th, Paris was free again. Into the city came France's leader, Charles de Gaulle, to establish the Fourth French Republic. In his person were centered the faith and hope of the French people that France would become once more a great and radiant power. And as the Allied forces marched on toward Germany, paying the price in blood and suffering, over all of once Nazi-held Europe, there was the promise of liberty again, no matter what the cost. For that liberty which Paris now enjoys is a condition of life without which no democratic nation can exist. Without it, no man, woman, or child can know the peace, security, and happiness of civilized life.